And this morning we're going to talk about the Lord's Supper. It's also called the Cup of Blessing, and the word communion is used. It's important to show the distinction between biblical communion or the Lord's Supper and what's commonly practiced with the Catholic Church. If you would go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. If you look at the first two verses in 1 Corinthians, it says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I deliver them to you. There are two biblical ordinances. Who knows what they are? <laughs> Baptism and communion. Baptism and communion. And baptism, I'm going to put you on the spot, all right? Baptism is a picture of? Washing away all your sins. I'm just oh, wrong answer. Yeah. <laughs> the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Now, he died for all of our sins. Salvation is a free gift. It's by trusting in him, literally believing in your heart, trusting in him and only him. It's not by your good works. It's not by trusting in baptism or a changed life. Communion also is a picture. It is symbolic of our salvation. The Lord kept the Passover, and then he did something special, unique, different, and new as he was introducing the New Testament, the New Covenant. The Old Covenant had to pass away. It was flawed, not because God's Word is flawed, because people are flawed. He introduced the New Covenant, faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the Messiah had been revealed, the Son of God being Jesus. So he showed that to his disciples the night of his death. He was teaching them, or the night before I should say, about his body being broken and his blood being spilled for the sins of the world. So it also is symbolic. Some people try to add a third ordinance. They'll say that foot washing should be kept and remembered. Um, I don't see that one there. So keep your shoes on. <laughs> Now, at this time of year, we start to talk about the Lord's Supper. It is very important, and it's something where there's an opportunity of a blessing. It is called the cup of blessing. It's the cup of blessing. We get to drink from the cup of, if you will, salvation in that Jesus is the living water, and once you take the drink of that, you'll thirst no more. It is the cup of blessing, and we are blessed because of Jesus and for no other reason. We're, be, we're blessed because of the gift of God, which is eternal life. So salvation's by faith, and because of that, there is an event that the local church would keep, the New Testament church, teaching what Jesus accomplished as we remember him. In 1 Corinthians 11, I want, I want to give you a couple things real quick. Let's read, if you would. Look at verse 23, if, you still, if you're in your Bible. Verse 23 for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. So in other words, Paul here is writing, this is what Jesus gave me, and you already know about it. That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. So he tells them to do this in remembrance of me. That's what Jesus told the twelve disciples. Paul is saying, we're going to keep the ordinances as have been delivered unto us. It didn't stop with Jesus. It didn't stop with the twelve. It continues way beyond. Verse 26, For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till ye come. So the point is to remember that he died for your sins and rose again. And notice it says, till he come. 
It's very fitting in this month as we're really focusing on prophecy and on Wednesdays we just started in the book of Revelation and I think it was Revelation 1 5 where it talks about his blood the importance of his blood there are false prophets that deny the power of his blood and the power of the cross the power of the New Testament the New Covenant well we remember it because I'm saved because of what he shed his blood for me it covers all of my sins and also he's coming back till he come when he comes back I have a resurrection to look forward to and there's also a reward for the work that I did while I was here on the earth this is something we should remember we as a church collectively do it near the end of the year some churches choose to do it near the Easter season others do it periodically throughout the year there are other false churches that say that you must do it every time you gather and I don't think that's the right response look at verse 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. When it says sleep there, it's talking about those that have passed. There are some that will partake in the Lord's Supper as a show in the flesh, and yet they're not right in the heart. And there's a punishment for that from God. He says in verse 31, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. I want to give you a couple of thoughts. If I can get two young men to come up and I want to give a handout. Um, the Lord's Supper, if you notice in verse 19, while they're coming up here, it says, for there must be also heresies among you. And what has happened, there are many heresies concerning the Lord's Supper. Let me give you one. Here's one heresy. Don't keep the Lord's Supper in the congregation. Do it at home. Do it on your own. Now, the Bible is clear that this was a church ordinance. Church means congregation or assembly. The truth is the Christians are commanded to keep the ordinance in the congregation. Notice he says, keep the ordinance as I delivered. Luke 22, he made the statement, this do in remembrance of me. Jesus did it in his church of his disciples. And here, Paul is writing, saying, you're doing it in your local church with your people. Now, they were doing some things wrong, and he was going to deal with that. One of the major heresies about the Lord's Supper, or misunderstandings to some people, heresy that, to those that teach it, would be what's called transubstantiation. Who knows what that big word means? They think the bread literally turns into the body itself. That's correct. The bread literally becomes flesh. The truth is, the bread and the juice is a symbol of the gospel. It's the symbol of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. We're just showing what he did as we remember. We're thankful for his forgiveness, and we're looking forward, we're hopeful to his return. In Hebrews 9, he says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. He says once for all. Jesus entered into heaven with his blood after his death, and he resurrected, he took the blood, and he has obtained eternal redemption. We are not saved by keeping the Lord's Supper or communion. It has nothing to do with salvation. The Catholic Church will teach, we have, you must keep Holy Communion, and they'll get up there and they'll pray to Mary. They'll have a statue that looks like a sunburst. That is called a solar monstrance. It is an idol. It is a pagan idol. They speak of the wafer. They say that that wafer, the cracker, or bread, is the presence of the Holy Spirit. 
Now the Bible says the, presence, the Holy Spirit indwells us, His Spirit comes in us, makes us a new man to lead us and guide us into the truth, to help us understand the Scriptures, to give us boldness in preaching the Gospel. The Holy Spirit is not a wafer, a cracker, or a piece of bread. The Catholics obviously paganize a lot of the biblical tradition and try to change it, pollute it, pervert it, just as they have the priesthood, uh, the local church concept, and, and many other things. There's another heresy about the Lord's Supper. They will say that you must drink alcoholic wine. Now, all alcoholic wine is fermented. A better word is corrupted. It's interesting that this is a picture of the Passover. The Passover was a time when they got all the leaven out of their house. The leaven was the bacteria that makes bread rise. Leaven is also on the outside of the grape skin. That is what causes it to ferment. That bacteria on the outside of the grape skin, if you leave it sit, that bacteria will begin to eat the sugar and it essentially urinates alcohol. So alcoholic wine is corrupted, it's fermented. New wine is when you crush grapes. Wine is a juice. That is what the word means. It's also called the fruit of the vine. That's how Jesus referred to it. Jesus did not serve alcoholic wine. He did not create alcoholic wine. He did not drink alcoholic wine. There are many things in the Bible called wine. In some one instance, it refers to squeezing the berry, squeezing the grape, and wine coming out of it. It's not alcoholic when you, scree when you make fresh juice. So wine in the Bible, you must discern, is it alcoholic wine or is it non-alcoholic wine? You can go to Winn-Dixie today, Publix, Walmart, and get non-alcoholic wine or alcoholic wine. You can get either one. Now, as Christians, we're commanded not even to look at it as it moveth itself aright, it says in Proverbs 23. When it's moving itself aright, that is the fermentation process. That is when the bacteria, the fungus, begins to eat the sugars and it urinates out alcohol, which our body sees as a poison. It is designed, even the Bible admits, for it's someone that is about to die as uh, to help you to eliminate the pain of cutting off your arm. Or, you know, in, in, in America, in World War, there was, or the Civil War, there were many instances where somebody, they would take off a belt, you got shot in the arm or the leg or you're damaged, and they would try to use a tourniquet, a, a belt, and they would make them take a drink of whiskey or rum, and then they would begin sawing off the arm so that the infection doesn't sit in and you don't die from the wound. That's a legitimate reason for taking alcohol so you don't feel the pain of somebody hacksawing the rest of your arm off. <laughs> in the church, though, we should not drink alcoholic wine because in the Christian life you should not drink alcoholic wine. Alcohol is a form of a drug. It's a medicine designed for those that are sick. And if you haven't figured it out yet, alcohol and drugs destroy families. They destroy your mind. They destroy your body, churches, individuals, and everything else that it touches. Again, the truth is that, that Jesus used the fruit of the vine, not corrupted wine. Wine just means juice. You must discern by context what it's talking about. Leaven is always a picture of sin in the Bible. So having sin in your juice, if you will, is not acceptable in the church. Even Jesus, after he introduced the Lord's Supper, Judas being there with them in Luke 22, he says, For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. He, Jesus is literally saying that night they drank the fruit of the vine, grape juice, and had bread and had a meal. Now we know that Jesus is our Passover. And so then he said, I'm not going to drink any more juice until I come back in my kingdom and I sit down on this earth. And that's called the millennial reign of Christ, where he sits for a thousand years with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and we will be there with him. He says, I'm not drinking it again until I come back. Another heresy is closed communion. Who is familiar with this concept? We had um, a missionary family come through and visit with us a little while back, and that night, he didn't know it, the, he had a large family, they homeschool, they travel, I think they're in Brazil now. Um, they per came and he, we had communion that night, and uh, the Lord's Supper, and he was taken aback. And he says, I've never seen anybody have open communion. 
I said, well, Jesus did, and so did the church of Corinth. I said, can you show me any example of closed communion in the Bible? And he started to answer, and he stopped. That's interesting. I might have to get back to you on that. Now, he was at least a Berean, and he studied the Scriptures. There were several things we talked about, end times timeline and everything. And he came back. We had a two-hour session, just him and I, a marker board, talking out a lot of different things. And I appreciate his spirit of being willing to receive it. It is heretical. It goes against the concept of the Lord's Supper to kick somebody out. Now, the way we practice it in our church is the head of the household decides who will participate with it. We're going to do it the last day of the year. In the Old Testament, when they had the Passover, it was as the beginning of the new year. And that's a time when we begin to make New Year's resolutions and evaluate ourselves. And so it's, I think it's a perfect time as we say, what did I do last year and not do? And what do I want to do next year? It's a good time to examine ourselves. What's interesting is Jesus allowed Judas to partake. And we actually see it in every count, account, every instance. Judas was not only not saved, he had a devil, and he partook of the Lord's Supper. Uh, he, in each of the gospel accounts, in Luke 22, it says, Likewise also the cup af after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me at the table. He literally says, here's the bread, here's the cup, and by the way, the one that's going to betray me is right here with me. So Jesus handed the sop to Judas. He handed the cup to Judas. He was still there and present, totally unsaved in heresy. One of the heresies I also see is where people say, do it however you want to do it. Bring your own food. You can make it your supper. Now, we do a lot of eating in this church. If you didn't notice, it says Baptist on the sign out there. All right. We love to eat, you know. Hey, we have a super, well, we usually call it super salad. Now it's soup or salad or soup and salad. Anyway, we, we eat every chance we can get because that's a gift from God to be able to eat your food and be able to digest it and appreciate what he's given to us. Um, but every time we get together and you bring a crock pot, that is not the Lord's Supper. There are some places that teach that. And that's what was wrong in Corinth. They were all bringing their own supper and one was eating before another. Could you imagine if I said, hey, everybody, we're going to eat lunch today. And you said, well, I'm a visitor. I didn't bring any food. And I said, that's fine. You can come and watch me eat steak. And then Brother Jake, because he didn't work last week, he's just eating breadcrumbs, you know, and picking some grass out of the yard, trying to make a salad, right? Wouldn't that be wrong? And, you know, I mean, come on, that's not cool. Now, when we eat around here, we try to always have enough and there's always enough to share. And uh, we, we counted a blessing. Uh, there is a heresy that uh, people will say, you know, everybody, let's have a potluck and call it the Lord's Supper. That's not the biblical pattern. Jesus gave us a clear pattern. It, the Lord's Supper is only unleavened bread and unfermented juice. That's all that is included in the Lord's Supper. Remember, He is our Passover lamb. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, He is our Passover. There's no meat in the Lord's Supper. Uh, he says in... Verse 20, when you come together, therefore, in one place to eat, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunken. So somebody's full, oh, I'm already full, and you're just now getting here, you missed the Lord's Supper because I had my own supper. It's not your supper, it's the Lord's Supper. It's symbolic, it's separate, it's special. It's a very somber moment. The point of the Lord's Supper is to celebrate what the Lord did in His first coming, and here's the cool part. If you're a sinner, and I reckon all y'all are, including me, then we get to plead the blood of Christ and say, I am a sinner saved by grace, and keeping this Lord's Supper is an example of how he spilled his blood for me, and his body was broken for me. I deserve to die and go to hell, and Jesus took my punishment, so I don't have to go. We celebrate in that regard, but then we also commemorate and we have this goal. I want to anticipate that one day the Lord is coming back and when he returns, I will be resurrected. And it, yet it says, and he has his reward with him. So when I meet the Lord in the air, I'm going to be rewarded for what I did. I imagine it'll be instantaneous. Time doesn't really hold him back. I imagine it'll just be a split second. I'll get a new name, a new body. I'll be rewarded. I'll have an eternal purpose. I'll have a mansion in New Jerusalem as he 
begins to pour out his wrath, uh, I'll have my reward almost instantly when the Lord returns. I need to look forward to that now. Listen, uh, if you work for somebody on a weekly basis, Friday at 4 o'clock isn't the time to start worrying about your paycheck. You should have done that throughout the week. Same thing with our life for the Lord. Let's work now. Let's not wait until the end of our life. On your handout, briefly, I want to share these few thoughts with you. The Lord's Supper is symbolic of salvation. It is a symbolic observance. The unleavened bread is a symbol of the broken body of Jesus. The cup reminds us of the New Testament in His blood. We are to look back to the cross to remind us of forgiveness. We are to look forward to His return and our resurrection. Now notice I have this question here. Are you worthy to partake? Let me ask it this way. Please raise your hand if you would say, I am worthy to go to heaven because of my works. Well, I appreciate your honesty. Who would agree that salvation is the gift of God and it's totally free, not earned by being a good person? Well, amen. I want you to understand that the Lord's Supper is that very picture. Look at the verse in verse 28. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. I ask you this question, are you saved? Salvation is required to take the Lord's Supper, and it's not my job to inspect you. It's your job to inspect you. In fact, look at the verse I used there, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. It's your job to prove it to yourself that you're saved and you're not lost. Now, you had Judas sitting among that first event, and he was rejected of the Lord, wasn't he? He did not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He had a hard heart. He was in it for the money. He was a fake. And yet, he participated in the Lord's Supper just as I imagine nearly every Lord's Supper that's ever happened in every real church, every real event, there have been those that are saved, and perhaps those that are lost. It's a personal issue. It is both public, and yet it's personal. At the end of the year, when we pass around the bread, and we break the bread, and we pass around the juice, I'm not going to be looking to see who's participating. But you need to look at yourself. It's a personal observation Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. You need to examine yourself whether you're truly saved. Are you just saying, yeah, I, uh, I started going to a church. Now I'm a Christian too. I'm a Christian. I checked that on Facebook. I'm not a Muslim or a Democrat or anything. You know, come on. What do you think I am? Biblical Christianity is much more than that, and yet it's super simple. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Simple. Easy. Salvation is easy. The Christian life is hard, and... Most of us are hypocritical in some areas of our life, and the Lord wants us to begin to examine ourselves and work on ourselves and evaluate ourselves and purge ourselves of that leaven once a year and say, you know what, Lord, I've been struggling with that sin, and I want to kick that one, and I want a better year next year. Can you help me? This also is a good time to evaluate your Christian walk. Are you saved? This is a once-in-a-year time to meditate on the forgiveness of the Lord and to also look forward to His return and our resurrection which has the reward. 1 Corinthians eleven thirty one. 31, For if we should judge ourselves, we should not be judged. And I just have to say this. Don't skip the cup of blessing. Don't skip your blessing. Don't skip the Lord's Supper. I know someone a few years ago, they were talking to me about this, and they said, Brother, listen, I've been smoking for years, and I just can't kick it. And I know the Lord wants me to quit, so I don't feel worthy. I'm, uh, what's the phrase? Um, are you worthy? Well, now, wait a minute. If salvation was dependent upon me quitting smoking, then I'm in trouble. If the Lord's Supper is dependent upon you quitting smoking, well, then that doesn't make sense either because it's a picture that you're partaking of the cup of salvation, that you've taken the gift and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you're saved. This is a great time of the year. Yes, look at your sin and what's holding you back from serving Christ, but don't skip out on your opportunity to come before the Lord in the congregation and personally say, Lord, I know I'm saved and I thank you for forgiveness and yeah, there's things I need to work on, Lord, and I ask that you would help me to get through it. 
There is a blessing for evaluating yourself and working for the Lord. In the previous chapter, chapter 10, I have it there on your handout. It says in verse 16, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. Communion means speaking or being friends with, in a sense, and what it's talking about, I'm in the body of Christ by, by salvation. I am in the body of Christ and I am covered by the blood because it's a free gift. I didn't have to earn it. And if you don't have to earn it to be saved, you don't have to earn it, if you will, to keep the Lord's Supper. But it is a great time of the year to evaluate yourself. I have a verse at the bottom here. If we'll read this, look at it together. It says, Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. This prayer is so awesome. He's saying, Lord, I know I have problems and sins and shortcomings and I want to work on them and help me to get stronger. And then he says, you are my strength. He says, you are my salvation. The good news is, if you're saved, you can partake in the Lord's Supper. And I encourage everybody that is saved. Um, I believe it's our duty. We have two ordinances. Once you get saved, get baptized as a public show of saying, I was lost, but now I'm saved. And when the Lord's Supper, when this opportunity comes around, it's the same opportunity. It's both a public profession, but it's for personal inspection. Let a man examine himself. And I encourage you, what a great time of the year to plead the blood of Christ over your shortcomings in 2023. What a great opportunity to look forward to what God can do with you in 2024. The Lord's Supper is coming. Please begin to prepare yourself. Be in prayer what God would have you to do. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the gift of salvation. Lord, help us to truly understand how awesome it is. Lord, help us to recognize our many sins that you have already forgiven. Lord, if there be anyone here today that has not yet taken the cup of salvation by trusting in your finished work, I pray that you would open their heart and their mind to receive the gospel. And we ask all this for your glory and your power. We love you so much, Jesus. Thank you for saving us. Amen.